Even ten years ago, it was not uncommon among scholars to hear them say, as I have heard them say, in answer to the claim of the Sufis that a thing must be studied in accordance with its own requirements, it must be studied by participation. They said, is a stone as much of an authority on stones as a geologist? This was the standard reply. It's been said to me. It's also been said to me in a senior common room in England was, a rose may be a rose, but it cannot be a horticulturist, which is superior, you see. So this was, until very recently, has been the mentality, has been the, the actual claim. This mentality is still there, of course, the assumptions so on, but it hasn't got a monopoly anymore. But there's still a very real danger that as we convey a lot of the materials which we want to convey and the means whereby to do them, people will try to adopt individual pieces, bits and pieces of our information of our techniques and so on and build them into an idea system or into a supposed as, as a matter of fact there are two new systems which are based on our ideas which thousands of people even in this country belong to and they don't know they're based on some of the stuff we've published they have their gurus and they have their this and that but in fact I'm sorry to tell you they are pirated versions rather changed around a bit and they are good business now this process is likely to continue to happen psychologists Distinguished ones, I'm sorry to have to say, even have asked me, and I quote, for a little bit of Sufi psychology to work with. I get this from scientists, you see. The introduction of new knowledge, and by that I mean knowledge which is unfamiliar to the people who have it at present, is always difficult. And its maintenance and sustaining and protection is always difficult. It's exactly as difficult as doing a technological thing in a developing country. It's uh, equally difficult. But it can be done. It is being done. Since recently I have received so much, so many indications, especially from the United States, hundreds of letters from people who regularly do confuse this idea of emotionality with spirituality and uh, religion with uh, schmaltz. I don't know what other word there is for it. Sugar, sweetness or something like that. I really want to tell you that this isn't new. It's always been necessary to divide out these two things, except that the experiential one, the higher knowledge one, has been temporarily eclipsed in the West, so you've only had, as it were, the schmaltz on the whole. So I'll tell you this is a story by Jalaluddin Rumi about this point, which shows you exactly how, in 1260, this problem was there, and it was necessary, before you do any further teaching or learning, to make this distinction between a higher and lower level of understanding. Not that the higher or lower level is there or isn't there, but whether or not you are able to distinguish between the two in your own mind, or at least to know what the lower level is in order to be able to go for something higher. If your aspiration isn't high enough, you will mistake something lower for the higher thing. And this is for sure, that's standard. In fact, I have the reputation because of this four-minute mile thing, because I once said on television, that we're living in a pessimist culture because nobody tried the four-minute mile because it was impossible until somebody did it and then everybody's doing it. Now I got this headline, Shah says we're all pessimists. But it was true. It's because your standards are too low. Don't have low standards. Why have low standards when you can have high ones? Now there is this story by Jalaluddin Rumi, and you may know it about Moses and the shepherd. Moses is going along and he sees this shepherd with a comb and he says, Oh God, I want to comb your hair, I want to serve you, I want to mend your sandals, and I want to wash your clothes and bring you milk, O oh God, says the shepherd. Of course, Moses gets incandescent with this, you see. He goes up to this fellow and he accuses him of foolishness and familiarity, blasphemy and ravings. And the shepherd humbly says, you know, I'm sorry, I, I'll try not to do it. And he goes off, you know, abashed into the desert. Well then, the tale tells us uh, an inspiration comes to Moses from above, customary inspiration. And the inspiration says, you have separated this man from his idea of God. At each stage, a human being has a relative conceptual framework. In other words, he assigns certain qualities to things which he cannot fully understand. And what is essential is the reality. The figurative expression, which is God, I would like to wash your clothes on, is a secondary thing. Well, now you might say, ah, oh, ha-ha, don't attach yourself to secondary things, though. Yes, but in that condition, 
that stage of accessibility and culture, that shepherd, was getting something on his level, idolatrous or blasphemous, almost, I don't know what you might call it. He was stabilized on the level of, shall we call it, sort of pre-religion or primitive religion, or something like that. Now, there had to be a breakthrough, as it were. Moses was on the higher level, perhaps from a metaphysical point of view, not so high, but higher, in which he says, God is imminent or in, invisible or hasn't got hair. So anyway, after he got this admonition from above, Moses ran into the wilderness, ran all over the place until he found the shepherd. And he told him, look, your idea of religion is acceptable to God. I've had a message about it. And there isn't anything wrong in anybody imagining something imperceptible by means of his own imagery. This is what he told the, the shepherd. Right? So that means that the satisfactions obtained through one's own level of perception of something are legitimate. In other words, if you can't be a spiritual person, be a sentimental person, like all schmaltz, perfectly all right, legitimate. But where do we get the question of leaving the door open or pointing out to the next step in the ladder, the next rung on the ladder beyond that? How do we do this? Are we to... We have to be so fascistic, I nearly said, intolerant of other people. We have to be so scornful of other people that we should say, oh, it's good enough for them. Yeah, just tell them a bit of religion, make them feel, you know, oh, isn't he good and isn't it wonderful and we're all so nice and sweet. I mean, that's good enough for them because this is what people implicitly, if not explicitly, do do. The story goes on from here, so let's see if it'll rescue me from the <laughs> difficulty of answering that one. This shepherd turns around to Moses, who's been saying, it's all right, you can go on about the combing the hair and the carrying the milk and those things. And the shepherd turns around and says, well, now, this shock I got from you, about being superficial, that really made me think, I mean, that raised me to a higher level. So, I am now beyond imageries. I don't need the comb. I do not want to mend the sandals of God. I do not need to. I see what you meant. Although Moses had done something wrong in this in one sense by disturbing this man's equanimity without knowing whether he could do anything for this man to stabilize him on a higher level, to make him more truly spiritually minded by means of an abstraction, yet the man himself had managed to benefit from that unregenerate or unenlightened blow. So, this kind of thing does happen. In other words, things which may appear to be destructive or hostile are very often stimulative or instrumental. Depends how paranoid you are. Evidently, this shepherd was not so paranoid. From this story, though, we can see at least three stages in the Sufi psychological system. When a Sufi knows what a person really believes and what he or she really wants, that means what the assumption system is that you're working on, this Sufi, he or she, can tell whether this knowledge, this higher consciousness, this thing, which we say is the same as everybody thinks it is, I mean, it's not different from the Hindu conception or the other, whether it will be of any use to that person or not at any given stage of this person's career. Because that's what the Sufi is for. Don't forget, the Sufi is not somebody who says, I'm a Sufi, I've read a book by uh, Professor XYZ. A Sufi is, of course, in our terminology, the product of the system. You try to tell it to our Sufi brothers and sisters who are, <laughs> who are uh, trying to comb God's hair. But nevertheless, the Sufi is the product of this. So, this product of it has got an idea, can diagnose, that's his job, he or she, his or, her, his or her job, to tell what you can learn and when and where and how you can learn it. He then scripts his teaching or the constellation of impacts in accordance with that. He may have, for local or other reasons, perfectly legitimate to uh, couch this in culturally acceptable terms as far as he can. But don't forget, he has what you call, I believe in America, an overview and he can do so. He's able to do so. Two things have to be imparted to the person who 
may want to learn to be a Sufi, or may want to go into this thing, or may want to know what it is, two things have to be imparted to this person before he enters into it, as it were. And one is, enough about it, enough of a feeling for it, enough of a sense of it to know whether it fits him, whether it is for him, whether he does want to go into it, or whether it isn't really rather a nasty thing, because he doesn't have all those wonderful things that he thought it did, which were used in 11th century Persia, or which um, <laughs> are, uh, you know, uh, used to stir up the emotions of dullards, or something like that. Now, the other thing he needs is to have some degree of experience of uh, I hesitate to say spiritual experience, but some sense of the vibes of the thing. There's some kind of a vibe involved, you see. It's a great word, vibe. Now, it, in other words, he or she feels something about this thing. It's uh, a sort of feedback. People call it a spiritual force, right? You, whatever turns you on. It is a feedback from the person. It is a perceptible thing. It is spiritual in the sense of being no other word for it, no better word for it. But it's certainly not spiritual in the sense of being bracketed with mawkish sentimentality and all sorts of very peculiar things that are, that are accretions to the spirituality. But these two things are needed. Now, they cannot be communicated by nor monitored by means of literature or mass meetings or whatever. They have to take place, not so much one-to-one, -one, but they have to take place by a kind of a personal contact of a relatively small number of people together. They have to. We have a maximum size of numbers of people who can share a certain kind of attunement. This isn't like a sort of Nazi party rally where the more people you have, the more you feel it. You know? <laughs> the Hitler is the thing. It's, it's the reverse. It's a kind of doctrine of minimum vibes. The less vibes you feel, the better, but you've got to feel some sort of thing. Now, once upon a time, there was a Sufi who was in the habit of making what seemed to his hearers to be disjointed utterances. Now, he did this because it was through such behavior that he himself had learned to be what he was. And because the people who were listening to him, presumably, said they wanted to be like him and to learn. But, although he'd learned like that, and the people thought they might learn like that from him, it was too much for a certain conventionally-minded scholar who said to him at last, now look here, my friend, be more specific, explain your experiences lucidly, delineate the truths which you have come to, point out something about the path and how it's done and what the stages are, give me an idea of the, what it'll cost and the time it'll take and do something, you know, uh, get organized. So, all right. Now, our mystic was very kind-hearted, kind-hearted, or they always generally are kind of kind-hearted mystic, and, um, but uncharacteristically for his trade, although necessarily for the purpose of maintaining this story, he tried to do it. And he got the other hemisphere going, the brain, and he tried and he tried and he tried. Finally, he got all his thoughts marshaled in words, organized, wrote it all down in a long and quite impassioned, but that's all right, and grammatical account, got it all down on paper, uh, illustrated by diagrams, and the whole story A through Z, how he did it. Sent it off, special delivery, to the scholar who read it. And the next day, the manuscript came back to our hero, and all it was written in the writing of the man of learning, to whom he had sent it, these words, and I quote, the admitted increase in your ability to express yourself has, however, unfortunately succeeded only in revealing the inadequacies of your logic. That's supposed to be a true story. So that's why we insist that these things that we isolate as, shall we say, the teaching, the teacher and the taught, have to be in alignment. We have to insist on this very frequently, as you may have noticed, because we don't have the kind of sequential, pyramidal or whatever, hierarchical alignment from which it becomes self-evident. The diagram of which it is self-evident that this alignment must take place or is so. This alignment, therefore, has to take the form of an attunement 
Well, this attunement, as vibes as I tried to call them, takes place pragmatically, as it were. That's to say, somebody has to keep the thing going, and that somebody, or those some people who do keep the thing going, employ traditionally almost any kind of method. I mean, you may be more familiar with uh, exercises or literature or whatever, but the totality of the learning operation, which is what I, all I'm really interested in, believe it or not, is a highly complex and technical operation the description of which isn't possible except in the actual event, by which time it isn't really needed, the description, because the event is working. All right. Now, we have a story about that which shows what goes wrong. And those of you who are from India or who have been there probably know this story. Anyway, it's about this fellow who goes into a restaurant uh, to have curry and rice. And he orders the curry and rice. Those of you who have been in India may know, of course, that the curry usually comes first or the rice comes first. You hardly ever get both of them together. This chap, the hero of this perennial story, he sits down the rice and the, what came first? It doesn't really matter. You know, he got very hungry and uh, neither of the things had arrived. So he calls the waiter, where is the well time? Tell me, sorry, sorry, you see, the curry is ready, but the rice is not yet ready. So he said, all right, bring me the curry, then I'll eat that. So he starts eating this curry, and he's rather hot, but he manages to get it down. And he says, bring me some rice. So then he says, all right, sir, the rice is ready, but the curry is finished. So he says, well, all right, he starts to eat through this white rice, and everything. Look, get me a little bit of curry to go with it. And this goes on, to and fro, backwards and forwards, until he cannot stand the thought of curry or rice for the rest of his life. He's an Indian. So this is an analogy of what happens if you don't know how to articulate the various components which go into a metaphysical learning system. So, you not only don't get the curry and the rice together, or you might call them intellect and emotion, or there's one half the other half of the brain, but you get surfeit. The Sufi does not have the same uh, assumptions about life as the Hindu guru. He does not uh, concern himself with, for instance, uh, reincarnation. But he does claim to have, or is supposed to have, some kind of a doctrine, some kind of a shape, certain sort of constant factors. For example, the Sufi will say that knowledge of absolute truth transforms humanity, inwardly if not outwardly, in a way which enables him to put things into a total, absolute perspective, which it is not possible to attain by any other means. He does not claim that this is accessible only to the few, or whether if you're born a Brahmin or anything like that. Now, he will also teach, and many major historical Sufis took no disciples and wouldn't teach by any overt method. He is able to teach by virtue of the perception which enables him to tell who to teach, when and how. Now, the very disjointed nature of this tends to militate against uh, conventional, familiar mechanicality in which most of us live. I mean, if somebody says to you, look, um, you know, come back in 25 years, I'll have something for you. By that time, you will have found your spiritual fulfillment, I'm quite sure, somewhere else. Because 25 years is uh, rather like uh, the three and a half minutes that I could have given you my message in here. We're not allowed to do that. <laughs> But nevertheless, the Sufi must maintain this principle, because it's true. Not because it's an interesting conceit, but it is true. He is not a prisoner of the mechanicality of the environment, and not any more than he has to be. Sorry. Neither is he interested in Shakti Zam, pow, I got you there, now you are it, or something like that. But that may be that, or it may not be that. All that matters is the possibility of what he can do for you. He will do what he can do for you when he can do it, and you can't say fairer than that, as we say in England. He does not say, you are all going to be free, white, and 21, or rejuvenated and hygienic, or millionaires within such and such a period of time. He's going to say, he says, I have certain capacities. I must discharge these capacities as best I can. This involves a non-mechanical working with other people. Right, that's the other characteristic of the Sufi material. So he knows something about himself, he knows something about his real or potential student, and he knows how to teach this student. It doesn't really matter what the student thinks about the teaching. It doesn't really matter, except that, as they say, 
temper the wind to the shorn lamb, you have to give them a fair of a chance to realize that this is the doctrine. Otherwise, he thinks that you're not going to teach him or you're crazy or something. You don't give him the same opportunity because of his subjective characteristics. So, in other words, he constructs the study course. If he can teach you, it's another thing that your self-appointed Sufis won't tell you, although it's just as continuously in print and just as much emphasized in authoritative Sufi literature, which I didn't write myself a thousand years and more ago, that a Sufi is not allowed to teach because he wants to teach. I mean, this is contraindicated. There is a famous major Sufi who said, I had a desire to teach. I therefore ceased teaching until I became mature enough to do it properly without the desire influencing my ability and therefore my duty to my students. Now this is so far out to the Western mind where obsession is the best thing. I've got a vocation. Nothing will stop me teaching you. Even if I have to cut your throat, I'm going to teach you. It's so different. It's so strange. It's very oriental. But it works. And it is part of our tradition. And we must tell you, just as much as I have to tell you if you ask me why those funny men with long white beards and pointed caps twirl around here and there. I'm prepared to tell you. I must tell you, I do not believe that it serves any purpose that we should have a sort of capitalistic Soviet Union here in this corner whereby truth is fiction and I teach you such things as you want to hear. The equivalent of the Soviet Union where the censorship of communications is such that you only hear either what you want to hear or what I want to tell you. But that's what is happening to you. That's what people are telling you. That you will do this Sufi exercise and you will be a Sufi. That's what they are doing to you. That such and such a person is a Sufi and so and so is not a Sufi because he does not go into conniptions or compone or whatever the things are. That is what they are doing to you. But such people are spiritually good. They are not communist commissars. But to me, of course, the ground plan is exactly the same thing. The thing that the person is doing is the same. The knowledge available to you is being attenuated. You are living in a free society where other people are free to deceive you. Big deal, as I believe you say. <laughs> so somebody's got to fill in things that are left out, you know. It's like nature abhors the vacuum. Somebody's got to do it. So here am I, giving you some stuff that other people don't give you. Mechanical exercises won't do it. Sufi psychology involves the attunement of the Sufi with the individual who is interested in Sufism or who can be benefited by that Sufi, which isn't necessarily an instantly perceptible way. Sufis don't wear badges saying, I am doing good, watch me give this person a dollar or something, that proves I'm great. We don't do that. And an attunement with what the Sufi says to be an ultimate reality called truth. You may call it God. Now there is a harmonization which can only fully come about after a certain sort of practice and training. The only difficulty is it's no practice similar to any other practice I ever saw or heard of, and it's no training which looks like any other kind of training of which I ever heard. So it is rather difficult to know what word to give you for it. But it exists. It exists continuously. And generally speaking, it is probable that there are only two ways of insisting upon its validity, or at least its existence. Only two ways in which we can do so for the Western people. One is, we can say, now listen, we've got all this literature. We've got all these Sufis over the centuries. In the last 200 years, one substantial monograph or book has appeared every 14 days in the Western world on Sufism. Look up the uh, bibliographies of it. This is a the most written about thing in the world, just about. And people say, what was Susan? Where did it come from? It's got the biggest bibliography you can imagine. But it's got more than that. We have to talk to you in your terms. It has got achievers. That's to say, who wrote all these spiritual and literary classics? Were they idiots and con men and deluded lunatics? No, they were achievers. They were, and still are, heads of state and generals, if you like that kind of thing. You know, you name it, we got them. 
So in your language, we are very much in business. We aren't something like the Encyclopedia Britannica, I think, has died out in the 13th century. Been, I seem to remember something about a coelacanth which died out too. There was a fish. <laughs> it's now <laughs> found to exist. So scientists and even theologians and, and mainline scholars aren't always right about everything. So if you want to hear about us in our terms, we have to say things like, you know, in answer to the kind of approach which lies behind phrases like, if you're so clever, how come you're not rich? Our answer is, we are rich. Next question, please. We are prepared to come into your area, into your civilization, work within its norms, explain ourselves in not broken, relatively unbroken English. We are prepared to add a dimension to your understanding of things. We are prepared to introduce to you something which you can use. We are prepared to do it in your terms and in your type of setups, and not at the expense of your general ambitions and so on. So we are not shy to say these things. That's one way of doing it. That's one way in which we can bring it to you with some side of it, with some degree of high profile, because high profile is what you read, isn't it? And the other way is, we can introduce and maintain our operation in your midst. That's to say, we don't need your money to do it with. We need the goodwill of the U.S. Immigration <laughs> Service or something at most, that kind of thing. We are not uh, illiterate beggars from the Orient who don't know where we are and have to be befriended by our disciples, or neither are we in need of running any kind of ramp at your expense. We uh, don't need slaves because they exist very numerously elsewhere if for no other reason. So, we have got something to give you. You haven't got very much to give us that you're not giving the people in the East already, such as their transfer of technology and so on. That is happening. But there is something which we can give you. But this thing, or this series of things, cannot be given to people, because it's mutually exclusive, cannot be given to people who are demanding it in a form of a sort of second rate. Uh, oriental reach-me-down thing, as what Professor Ornstein has called, um, if we should have the science of the East and the philosophy of the West instead of the other way about. Well, you are getting a lot of second-rate and misleading material. If you want that material, then you really must, uh, we won't uh, mind, uh, leave us alone, you know. You'll do much better elsewhere. If you need this sort of hierarchical pyramidal structure and uh, sentimental intellectual nonsense, you can have it. I mean, I don't mind giving you that. I will set up, what should we say, a baseball team, and you can join that and root for it on exactly the same structure. You get your emotional kicks, you get your pyramid, you get your rah, 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 you get, I learn about baseball. How about it? Let's do that. That's what you want, because it's our business to know. It's our business to be able to analyze what makes you tick. It's not our business to be nice to you because you're our rich maiden aunt or something like that. It's our business to see the ground plan, the, the blueprint, the th way things are moving, the way things are working, and what organization can communicate knowledge and which one cannot. That's the business we are in. No other business. We have no other expertise. We are incompetent to tell you whether Ramanuja is more spiritual than Krishna Murti. We have not. I mean, you have your experts. You pay them fabulous sums to tell you all this in universities. We are incompetent to do that. We are in the spiritual and metaphysical area. We are not circus proprietors or even clowns. And we have come here to tell you that. You here may find this amusing or annoying or whatever you like, but we must be fair. And it's no use saying, um, I'm going to tell you the secrets for her. Here I am, I make you laugh, or uh, you're kind enough to laugh at me or with me, or whatever, and I am um, testing you, or uh, maybe his uncle will come and tell us the real truth or something. No, 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 I'm telling you the truth about this. I'm telling you that you may have been interested in a distortion. You don't need that distortion unless you have been habituated to a distortion about metaphysics. If you have, then you, you'll be able to devise one of your own or uh, shop around and get one of the hundreds which uh, are to be found anywhere, not just in California, but anywhere, including in the East. So, I just want to tell you that Sufism 
as I'll use the label, what is its intention? I'll answer that question for you. I mean, is it purposeful? People ask me, and what is its intention? This is, well, I'll tell you what it is. Its intention and purpose is understanding that which cannot be understood by conventional instrumentation, by just thinking it out, by going beyond normal limitations, that your emotions won't take you there, your intellect doesn't take you there, your standing on your head doesn't give you more understanding, or at least we are in the area of getting more understanding about humanity through getting beyond the limits of conventional understanding. Now, this is the first thing. So, you might call it knowledge. It is knowledge. So, people say, oh, yeah, but I don't want knowledge. I want love. I want God. I want spiritual. I want some heart in this. I mean, what, who are you? What is all this? I mean, this is, uh, this is kind of Russian or German or I don't know what this is, they say. So, well, I don't like this. I, I, you know, where did you get it? And who are you? And why, why do I get in here? And I want something. Can't you at least, you know, all right, so you tell me funny things sometimes. That's not too bad. I mean, but I'm gasping for, give me some spirituality, they say. It's, I read it off, you know, we have our ways. We must differentiate one thing from another. This is human and spiritual necessity. Even spiritual necessity, if you're worshipping the devil and you think you're worshipping God, that's not, they're not differentiating one from the other, it won't get you anywhere, right? Now, the main thing is humanity needs understanding both ways. It needs to be understood and it needs to understand. The Sufi path is primarily understanding. Understanding man and enabling man to understand. That means man, women and children. If in order to understand it is useful or necessary to increase the social aspect, the emotional, the intellectual, so that will be done. But social or emotional, spiritual activity without any understanding is not understood in Sufism. The undifferentiated, as somebody said, experience floods you out. Ooh, isn't it wonderful, you know? I feel love, it must be God. I feel God, it must be love. So this, we don't know anything about. So at least somebody is standing here and telling you there is some alternative to those people who say these other things, which may well suffice you better. You may have entirely different requirements. But I stand here to represent that stream which says the science of humanity has got as much religion, as much heart, as much humanitarianism as there is. Very little of it, however, is spurious or hypocritical. Very little of it. So, it is rendered in terms of understanding, and those people who don't like that word are better just investigate why they don't like that word. Then they could be doing something useful. If they say, oh, we want it in any packet, so we rather like it in one way or another, I'll tell you a little story. I had a friend who wanted to go to Rome on Holy Week, and he wanted to stay there, and he couldn't get in anywhere. You can't, can't get there, it's full up on Holy Week. So, what did he do? He put an advertisement in the Osovatari uh, Romano or some such paper saying, I do not love my neighbors. I am a bad man. People despise me, and I don't think much of the human race, but I very badly need a room in Rome in Holy Week. And hundreds of people desirous of buying something for themselves to convert this heathen in Holy Week offered him rooms. And this is absolutely true. What about their human duty of offering rooms to people in Holy Week who are their own kith and kin, flesh and blood, fellow believers or whatever, for whom there was no expectation of anything? That's the sort of morality we are interested in. We become very unpopular and people think that we are some kind of nuts or something because we say it's no great glory to you to give charity or pick up your fellow man when he has fallen over to weep over the bereaved. And this is your minimum duty as a human being. Below that you're not a human being at all. But I have to come to a country where I'm told oh, I don't like the way you talk about this sort of thing but oh it's so beautiful the way somebody gave a hundred bucks to somebody else. Now, our morality scale is quite different from yours. We don't talk about these things, we do them. 
quite different. Whereas people tell me here in the West, and not only in the United States, but in many other countries, oh, but you can't get any money out of people for good causes unless you break their heart, work on them, are hypocritical, and make them think they're wonderful, and put their names on, uh, I don't know what, I think it's hospital beds or something like that. Has anybody thought, don't you know how to give without being, having your arm twisted? I mean, don't you, haven't you ever heard of that? But you call this godly. Now, which of us is right? I invite you to think about it, that's all, just think about it. Because you can't build a higher morality on what can be considered by somebody else a lower one. I mean, or can you? Yes, if he's completely wrong, yes, you can. But you know, if you go on doing these things, which set your sights too low, you do something which you think is wonderful. You say, oh, that was so great, oh, it's just so great. Like the people who say to me things like, Oh, I, I like you, believe me, and when I say I like you, I'm being so sincere. People are actually saying that to me here in this country. And when I say I'm sincere, I am being so sincere and I couldn't be any more sincere. Well, I say to myself, is that sincerity? <laughs> but he never uh, wondered. It's a very clever trap, though, because if I say to somebody, you're not a kind and benevolent man, I am. I'm modest, I tell you. See what I mean? I can't say it. So I am not talking about myself. I'm just saying, there are people. It doesn't have to be me. There are other people. <laughs> Believe it or not, I know you've been in here a long time, but there are other people out there, for instance, who do not take such a low view of humanity as you do, such a low idea of morality as you do. A morality in the sense of doing good for your fellow human being because he is your fellow human being. I have to tell you all this because there is a growing sensation that a person who acts or an organization or an entity which acts descriptively in this area and is not acting in an emotional, sentimental manner, is not making quite sure from the Madison Avenue point of view that everybody thinks that they are good people, so, uh, are not in fact good people. Now, this is, I rather think, getting near to automata. We are working by automatic evaluation. Now, we don't believe in automatism. We are quite sure that we can make you happy, it's like lobotomy. We can make you quite happy, but we cannot make you spiritual. <laughs> so we have to represent the uncluttered path, like it or not. By finding an enemy who isn't here, we can reduce tension and uh, congratulate ourselves. And I have found, I regret to say, an American, but nevertheless, a person. He might not be an American, maybe he hasn't been naturalized yet, but so it's all right. Always living in a commune, you see. I heard him, here's a very interesting example, giving a very loud, a very impressive prayer, very weirdly dressed. And he told me he's a Sufi, and he is praying to God, and his arms are going up and down. Top. And his prayer was something like this God protect Joe, Bill, Mac, Lucy, Sanchez, Ticker Tacker's dog, and he was giving his spasmodic gestures. So I said to him, Why are you doing this? Is this, you know, how does the Sufi bit come? He said, Oh, well, my teacher told me that it's selfish to want something for yourself. I said, yes, that sounds reasonable. So he said, and you mustn't do it. But I'm kind of scared. So yes. So he said, so I live in this commune, and every day I pray, not for myself because that's selfish, but for everybody else, even down to the dog. Therefore, God won't let anything happen to this commune, and as I'm in it, I'll be safe too. <laughs> this actually happened to me. <laughs> so th if that is spirituality, <laughs> Give me materiality. <laughs> Absolutely true thing, and it wasn't very long ago. So, I will just end by giving you one other joke. <laughs> In a remote and mysterious and inaccessible fastness, where all the best stories begin, where they keep all those Sufis, there is a Sufi, he's talking to his disciple, you see, and he says, well, the student has just asked him, What's the difference between the different approaches to the acquisition of knowledge? This is one of our current jokes. So the student wants to use his abilities to delve into these various ways. How many ways are there of acquiring knowledge? Or call it what you like, spirituality, I, you know, I'm tired of being stonewalled. And tell them, how do I do it? So the old sage says, well, there are two possibilities of gaining higher consciousness to penetrate and to transcend the barriers of understanding and so on. These are the natural method and the supernatural method. The natural method and the supernatural.
Which do you want? Well, you couldn't ask fairer than that. The student says, well, what's the natural one? He says, the natural one is a Sufi way to pursue this study by its own methods as laid down by its legitimate practitioners. These methods which are inevitable because they are imposed, as it were, by a source, not by tradition, but by the facts of the situation. That is the natural method. Well, he says, all right, well, what's the supernatural method? Oh, he said, the supernatural method. Now, that's an interesting one because, says the old man, this would be if the analytical, academic, and scientific methods as used in the West were ever to obtain any results. That would be supernatural. 